Thank you so much. This is fascinating as always, uh, as I would expect from our illustrious chairwoman. Um, Mr. McLean, I want to I want to try to focus on climate change and particularly, you know, areas where we have, where at least from my vantage point, not yours, please chime in if you disagree, sort of the highest ratio of gaps in our knowledge to potential impacts. Um, and the, the first one is if you could just help me, and, and I, I ask this in the context of where should we be funding and where, you know, where should we be focusing a little bit more strongly. But first one is how, how comfortable are you that we have a, a good understanding of of changes in temperature and CO2 at depth and the impacts of mixing and how big a deal on that is, is if we are, if we have gaps in, in that knowledge. Congressman, we have labels of confidence in the IPCC, for example, and I'd have to refer you back and do a little bit more homework to give you that label of confidence. But I would offer you right now that we need to do much more work there in order to be looking at the climate cycle and the ocean climate cycle with carbon. So that, um, that's an area that we need more measurements. We need more opportunities to establish monitoring networks and such. One of the uh, key issues that we talk about is climate, uh, climate related carbon sequestration. And as we look at the great Atlantic conveyor belt as it's described, or the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, that's up in the Northern hemisphere. And we have the same in the Southern hemisphere. As we start to watch that slow down, that's very concerning to our European colleagues because that's what keeps those high latitude countries a little bit warmer from the Gulf Stream influence. If that slows down, what effects might await us? Further, if it slows down, how will the carbon that's taken into deep water and sequestered because of the organic activity in the upper ocean, how will that change? We need to know that a little bit better. So that's an area that I think warrants the kind of ARPA-O discussion that we were having or, or, or other type of innovative research to be putting more monitoring, more study of chemical and, and physical process, and then being able to see what that tells us for the longer term climate. In the near-term climate, I think we're pretty good at um, being able to project what, what scale and resolution of accuracy we can project. But for, for the longer-term effects, that's a necessary area of investment. Well, you have no surprise. You have exactly understood the reason I asked the question. That I've, you know, I've seen for years these discussions of Gulf Stream should slow down, maybe even stopping, maybe migration. Can you, can you help our panel understand it, you know, a little bit more tangibly what's at stake if that shows down and how it impacts our, our own climate and, and where the gaps are? Like, what do we need to know more to actually be able to predict if this is a big problem or just something that's scary but unlikely? At the broad stroke level, we're pretty good at understanding what the situation is. That situation is indeed concerning, and there are no off-ramps to this. We, we have to figure a way through this. If we look and realize that the ocean absorbs about 25% of the carbon dioxide into the ocean itself, just in the chemical gradient, there's a greater concentration in the atmosphere, the ocean absorbs it. That's changing the pH of the ocean. That means the ocean is getting more acidic. That's that is compromising the life cycle of many small, small organisms and even larger organisms that calcify. So by not understanding this fully, we're not able to give the kind of forecast for how people could hopefully mitigate, but perhaps even at a larger scale, look at the cause of this. What is causing the CO2 buildup? It, it is our current global energy source. And, and that informs policymakers that go beyond my ability or, or my domain, but we're just responsible for providing that science. The more mm -hmm. science we can generate to inform the right path forward for policymakers, the, the more informed our nation will be and the better decisions and choices we'll make. But the, the carbon buildup in the ocean, it's, it's acidification, it's a compromise of coral reefs, which are a lifeblood. Dr. Crosby was talking about the concerns for coral reefs. There are many impacts on coral reefs now, acidification being just one of them. And we also have a shellfish industry that is that's rooted in the ability to be predictable. This is a great disruptor of that prediction. But when we start talking about global circulation scales, there's still more that we need to know other than the broad strokes. We need that artistic fine brush of the portrait to be able to look with greater precision as what year, what years will we then be at what circumstance? Okay. I and hope if, that, if that, and if that, yeah, and I guess what I'm trying to say is if that, if, so if that thermal conveyor, you know, shuts down, as you said, and then Europe becomes much cooler because the heat isn't there, I, it, is it reasonable to conclude that that means that the United States goes the other direction, that that's where the heat is being pulled from? What, what happens to our continent if that conveyor belt shuts down or slows substantially? I think that's still an open question, and and I would I would have to defer to uh, really the state of the science right now, which which finds a number of issues that relate to that being 
not quite settled, but um, I'd be happy to follow up with you and even bring okay. some experts that could discuss that subject with you, sir. Very much appreciate that. Thank you. And I yield back. Uh, if I could uh, make a comment on that. One of the big gaps there, Congressman, is uh, our lack of knowledge of the deep ocean So and, and heat in the deep ocean. We know that 90, about 93% of the excess heat that's generated from uh, greenhouse gases goes into the ocean. And as a result of uh, uh, development of the Argo system at universities, including mine, and its operation by NOAA, we know the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean fairly well. Uh, but two things. Number one, uh, NOAA is having trouble uh, funding the, the complete Argo system. Number two, it only goes down to 2,000 meters. We now have instruments that are, are called deep Argo that would allow us to do the full depth. And that's the lower part of that overturning cycle. And one of the reasons we can't give you great uh, uh, answers to the question of what will happen as a result of uh, if, if this slows down is that we don't understand the deep part. So we have to add that to the Argo system uh, in order to be able to answer those questions. Uh, well, let's let's do that. And thank you to staff for uh, allowing Dr. Linen's uh, um, excellent answer and clarification beyond our time. Uh, well, you